Indian name uh, that means grapevine. And um, I pastored there with my wife, Cheryl, for 33 and a half years. And uh, we have um, some t two couples from our church. Uh, and I've actually been going to the University of the Nations for uh, quite a long time. Uh, but in any event, we uh, teach spiritual warfare and deliverance. And um, I used to come five or six weeks a year to Kona. And uh, uh, since uh, this whole COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, we've been slowed down just a tad. But in any event, um, we were able to come back again for the first time since this, uh, this COVID uh, outbreak. And we have... Uh, one of our staff pastors, uh, Brian Derrico, and his wife, Alicia. Wonderful people. Will you please stand up? And uh, Brian, turn around and show them your shirt. It says, give us a chance to love the hell out of you. <laughs> that's what people need. They got a lot of hell in them sometimes. And um, that's one of our mottos is just to love the hell out of people. Um, and then Wynn and Paula are also here. And um, Wynn and Paula, would you stand up? And uh, both of these couples have uh, been helping us uh, pray uh, deliverance and inner healing over people at the University of the Nations. So anyway, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I love these lays, you know. It always makes you smell so good while you're speaking. <laughs> But anyway, um, I want to talk to you just a little bit about my view of what God's doing in the world and tell you a little bit about my story. I grew up on a ranch in Idaho. In a little town, there were only uh, 3,000 people in the town. Uh, many more cows than that, many more horses than that, but 3,000 people. And uh, my father was an interesting guy. Uh, he was an avid hunter. He was a gunsmith. He was a hot shoe farrier, which means a guy that uh, put horseshoes on horses. Uh, he was a boxer. And, uh, and he was a pastor. And so that's quite an interesting combination, don't you think? So uh, I, thank, I thank God for my father. One of the things I, I'm thankful for is, though in his day he didn't understand uh, a lot of the things that we understand today, he, understand, he understood virtually nothing about deliverance or inner healing. Uh, but he, he understood the vastness of the kingdom, and he understood the pitfalls of organized religion. And so when I was a teenager, he said, uh, Dave, I want you to go with me to a denominational meeting of the Assemblies of God. Doesn't that sound exciting? I said, oh, oh Dad, please, no. He said, no, I'll never ask you to do this again, but I, I want you to come with me for at least the first day. Ah, okay. So I went to this boring religious meeting where, where they were just talking about how great they were, and you would think the sun uh, rose and uh, sat over this denomination. And uh, just when I could hardly take it anymore, he said, let's go outside. We walked outside. He said, now, son, uh, I w never want you to forget this. He said, these people are good people. They love Jesus. We'll no doubt see most of them in heaven. But they do not understand the kingdom of God. And they think that everything has to do with their little denomination. And it was, it was the Assemblies of God as a fairly large denomination as denominations go. But he said... Meanwhile, while they're here talking about how great they are, the kingdom of God is advancing through the earth, through unknown people, 
people that they will never know, they will never recognize. Uh, he said some of the great heroes of the kingdom of God are, are grandmothers living in mountain villages, and, and no one knows their name on earth, but everyone knows their name in heaven. And he said, uh, it, we don't want to be mean-spirited toward denominations, but never, ever get stuck in one. He said, remember, the kingdom of God is vast, and it's awesome, and it's, it's moving forward against all odds and all the nations of the earth. Yeah, and then he told me, you know, I could drive on home and didn't have to go to the rest of the meetings. But I, I really appreciate that about my father. Um, and so um, I had had an experience with the Lord as, um, as a young boy. And uh, I had a sensational experience. My mother is a very loving woman. And I'm the youngest of four children, and I was, um, I remember it vividly. It was before I went into kindergarten, and I was at home playing. I was playing with dinosaurs on the, you know, on the carpet. And I thought my mother come and came and stood behind me because my mother is a very, very nurturing, loving Christian woman. And you can feel the, the presence and power of love. And I thought any time she would, she used to call me Davy. I thought any time she'd say, Davy, whatever, you know. And I waited, and she never said anything. She never said anything. And so finally, I turned around and looked up, like, what, what's up, Mom? And there was an angel standing there. Now, I haven't, I've only seen two angels in my life. Uh, I've seen a lot more demons than that, but that's another topic. I've only seen two angels, and that was one of them. And that deeply impacted my life. And I turned around and looked up, and it was just like I was just uh, inundated with, uh, with eternal divine love that was coming from this being of, made out of light. And uh, it just smiled and faded uh, out. And it lo looked like it just kind of went up that direction and disappeared. And uh, just a little boy. I ran in and I said, Mama, I saw an angel. And uh, she was so sweet. She said, Davy, that is wonderful. That's your guardian angel. She said, sit on Mount Mama's lap and we'll look into the Bible. She read me where Jesus said, Allow the little children to come to me. Don't you know that their angels appear before the throne of the Father every day? And, and uh, she, she read me different verses about angels. And, um, and it really deeply impacted my life. And then she said, uh, we all have angels, but some people never see them. But God allowed you to see your, your guardian angel. And I think it's because God has a wonderful, wonderful plan for your life. Now, for a little uh, boy uh, that's just about five years old, that's a pretty impactful thing to happen. And so uh, I, I had a few other experiences. I served God as best I could through um, junior high and high school and high school sports and all, all that kind of stuff. And um, through default, I went on to a Bible college. I, I say default because I never intended to be a spiritual leader. Um, and uh, my father, uh, when I graduated, he, he asked me what my plans were. And I said, well, I haven't quite decided. I think I want to be a high school teacher and basketball coach. And, uh, but I love animals. I love horses particularly. And I, I said, I've also thought about being a horse veterinarian and and um, I just hadn't decided. So he said, why don't you go to Bible college for a year while you decide? And so I did. Went to Portland Bible College. And one year uh, at the conclusion of that, uh, he said, well, you know, they have a two-year program. And if you're not sure, just take another year and then you'll complete the two-year certificate. And uh, after that, um, I still hadn't decided. And... Uh, 
He said, well, you know, they have a leadership course that gives you a bachelor's in theology if you want to take two more years. So kind of by default, I did that. Still didn't know what I wanted to do. But my dad was pastoring a church at the time, and he said, hey, you wanted to be a teacher, and I want to start a Bible college. Why don't you come and uh, administrate uh, the Bible college? You can teach in it. And so I was, you know, still trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I had just married a wonderful, wonderful girl. Uh, my wife is just the best. And, um, uh, and her grandfather was a very famous healing evangelist named A.A. A. Allen. And he traveled the world, led hundreds of thousands of people to Christ, had uh, many, many miracles, uh, raised the dead, cast out demons, uh, sensational things. And she grew up watching all that as a little girl. She was born at his headquarters, which her father uh, built uh, for her grandfather, A.E. Allen. It was called Miracle Valley. And she was born on the corner of Faith Avenue and Deliverance Way. <laughs> and so she had a, a pretty good uh, a heritage going on there, right? And uh, I married her, and I started teaching in the Bible college. And um, I, I have never wanted to be hypocritical. It's just, I, I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to do one thing, say one thing and do another. I don't appreciate when other people are that way, and I never wanted to be that guy. But I had graduated from the leadership track of Portland Bible College with a bachelor's in theology. And now I was administrating a Bible college, Raymond Bible College in, in Aberdeen, Washington. And so because I was the administrator and I had a teaching gift, I was able to choose any of the Bible college classes that I wanted to choose uh, to teach. And so, I actually have always bored fairly easily. I don't like boring stuff, and uh, I tend to walk out if it gets boring. It's like, life's too short to listen to this anymore. And so I go to the beach or something, right? So, um, I had had my share of boring classes in Bible college, and so I decided I would teach the life of Christ, which is the opposite of boring. It's very exciting. Every page, there's something amazing going on. So I thought, I'll teach the life of Christ and the book of Acts, which also is quite exciting. So I was teaching these two classes, and I'll never forget that this, there, there was a short fella. His name was Joe Mathis. He sat in the back far right every class. And right from the beginning, um, he began to question me when I was teaching. And I would, I would say something about, you know, a miracle that the apostles did, which is virtually on every page in the book of Acts. There's something miraculous going on. Or uh, in the life of Christ, it's just one miracle after another. And every time I would mention a miracle, beginning with Jesus' first miracle, the turning of the water into wine, Joe puts his hand up. Excuse me. Yes, Joe? Have you ever done that? Done what, Joe? Turned water into wine. No, Joe, I've never done that. Okay, thank you. You go a little while later. Excuse me. Yes, Joe? Have you ever done that? Done what? Cured a, 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 a lame person. No, Joe. I've never done that. Well, it didn't take me very long to think either him or I have to go. <laughs> and I happen to be the administrator of the Bible college. So I went into the office and I, I wrote him a tuition check 
And I met him after class. I said, Mr. Mathis, here is a refund on your tuition. He said, wow, thanks. I said, you're welcome. He said, what's that for? I says, that's uh, a going away present. You're not enrolled in this Bible college anymore. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, not, not going to have you in class anymore, Joe. Thank you very much. He said, why? I said, why do you think? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, how about the fact that every time I mention something, you try to embarrass me in front of the whole class? He said, D did I embarrass you? I said, Joe, every time I mention a miracle, every time, you asked me in front of the whole class if I have ever done that, just so you get to hear me say, no, Joe, I have never done that. And he said, well, I'm not trying to embarrass you. I said, really, well, what exactly are you trying to do? He said, I'm just trying to find out if you've ever done that. He said, you know, I'm a brand new Christian. I said, no, I did not know that. He said, yeah, I, I just got saved a little while ago. And I, I don't know if these are things that are supposed to happen today or, or not. And I figured if anyone has done something like that, it would be the guy running the Bible college. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I never meant to embarrass you, but... I can see why you're embarrassed. I said, okay, well, let me just answer once for all. For the whole semester, you'll never have to ask me this again, ever. I said, I have never, ever done anything supernatural. Nothing. I have not walked on the water. I have not raised the dead. I have not told so somebody what the... The crippled arm to stretch it forth. Uh, whatever miracle we come to in the Bible, I can assure you, I have not done that. And he said, oh, well, no wonder you're embarrassed. And so I went, <coughs> <coughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I felt like it, but I didn't. I said, so are you finished with your questioning? He said, yeah, but please don't kick me out of the Bible college. I said, okay, I'll give you your tuition back and you can sit in class, but do not ever ask me again if I have done that because the answer is no. He said, okay. I gave him the tuition check back. And I thought, what a miserable person I have become. I'm a theoretician. I'm... I'm teaching a class as if I'm somewhat of an expert on the subject and and there is nothing absolutely nothing supernatural about my life so I was actually working for my father he it was he was the guy that was the president of the Bible College I was administrating so I drove straight to my dad's house I said, hey, Dad, guess what I did today? He said, what? I said, I kicked Joe Mathis out of the Bible college. He said, what? I said, yep, kicked him right out, refunded his tuition. And he said, Dave, he, he's a brand new Christian. Why did you do that? I said, because he kept embarrassing me. And he, he said, well, you should have talked to him about it. He, you know, he's a brand new Christian. Don't kick him out of the Bible college. I said, just relax. I let him back in. And uh, I took his tuition back. But uh, he got me to thinking about some stuff. And so, since you're the president of the Bible College, and since you were ordained when you were 17 years old, and since you have pastored your entire life in a denomination that claims to believe everything in the Bible, that claims to uh, endorse the exercise of all the spiritual gifts, 
I mean, it's one thing to be in a denomination that says, we don't believe that stuff. We don't believe in anything supernatural. And there's plenty of denominations that believe that. It's another thing to be in a denomination that says, oh, yeah, we got the full meal deal over here, right? We're not one fry short of a full meal deal over here. We believe the whole package. And then come to find out that there are no greater incident of miracles in that setting than over where they believe, nah, we don't believe the Holy Spirit is doing anything supernatural in the world. And I, I just said, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of struggling with that. So, I got a question for you. Said, yes? I said, have you ever in your life laid your hands on somebody with a disease, I'm not talking about the cold, and, and seen God work a miracle. He said, oh, yeah, many times, son. And I said, now, I'm not talking about somebody who gradually recovered. He said, well, you know, that's healing too. I said, no, 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 no. That is the, the natural state of affairs with human beings. It's called an immune system. And I, I said, when Buddhists and atheists and witches and warlocks and when it, when it happens to everybody, we can't really call that a miracle of God. And he said, well, son, you know, uh, not everybody gets healed instantaneously. And he told me the story about the the ten lepers that were, and, and going, they were, I, I knew all that stuff, right? I'd been to the uh, signs and wonders seminars, you know, where you see the sign and then you go in and you wonder where the miracles are. But anyway, um, I, I knew all those stories, right? And I said, Dad, um, I, I want you to answer me honestly. I'm talking about a bona fide Bible class miracle. You laid your hands on them, and they used to be crippled, and they're not crippled anymore. They used to be blind. They're not blind anymore. And he said, well, well, maybe not like that. He said, okay, well, that's my point. Do you know anybody that does that? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, and who would that be? He said, well, you know, Jack Sisler from Borneo. I said, okay, Jack Sisler from Borneo. I know all of his missionary stories. I'm talking about somebody in the USA that actually heals sick people by the power of God. He said, well, let's see. Let's see. Um, yeah, there's a guy named Leland Davis that I think has healed people. I said, okay, so you've been doing this your whole life, and you have to really, really think for a long time to come up with anybody that does this. So put yourself in Joe Mathis' shoes and ask yourself why he should believe that all those things are applicable to today because I think we've just been uh, faking ourselves out on a whole lot of things he said oh son don't don't be so hard on yourself and so I said okay next question I said yeah I said have you ever cast a demon out of anybody he said well no I said, doesn't that seem odd to you? He said, not at all. He said, I don't know anybody that's cast demons out of people except Jack Sisler from Borneo. And I said, and, and that doesn't seem odd to you because the classes I'm teaching right now, it happens on just about every page. And this is what he said. He said, well, son, we live in the United States of America. And I said, your point being? He said, well, you know, I don't think there are very many demons in America. <laughs> I 
I said, what? He said, demons, you know, they're, they're in places like India and Africa, and places where people worship demons. He said, that they're not in, like, nations like America. And I said, well, what about Jerusalem, Israel? Wasn't it like the heart of the earth at the time? And he said, huh, I never thought of that. I said, well, I did. It wasn't the, you know, the jungles or the deserts of Ethiopia. It was Jerusalem, Israel, right where the temple was. And there were demons all over. They were, you know, out by the seashore. They were in the temple. They were all over. And he said, huh, never really thought of that. And I said, well, Dad, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited, but I, I got a crisis going on here. I got to sort some stuff out for me. Oh, Dave, don't be so hard on yourself. And so I said, well, have you never ever seen anybody that you thought had an evil spirit? He said, well, yeah, one time. I thought, huh, pastored all his life, and one time saw somebody that he thought might have an evil spirit. Seemed odd to me. But I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, you know, this couple in the church, he said, he's got a drinking problem. And she called me one night and said, um, uh, Steve, uh, we had a, a marriage spat, and he got angry, and he left, and he's down at the bar. And if somebody doesn't intervene, he's going to go on a several-day drinking binge and lose his job, and we're going to lose our house, and we're, we've done this over and over before, and somebody has to intervene. So he said, I, I went down to the bar, to fetch him out of the bar. And he said, I came into the bar. It was a big bar, and it was really dark. He said, as soon as I stepped in, I heard a voice say, Preacher, you shouldn't be here. He thought, eh, I'm probably the only preacher here. He must be talking to me. So he said, I'm looking around, and I saw Steve, and he was in the far corner he was sitting alone at a table with the mug of beer, and he was staring down into the beer. No mirrors. And he thought, huh, wonder how he knew I came in. So he said, I began to mosey over toward him, and he slammed his hands down. And he said, a, really a terrifying voice. It wasn't Steve's. The voice said, I said go home. I said, and, and? He said, and what? I said, and how did the story end? He said, well, I went home. I said, that's how the story ends? He said, yeah, I'm, it was kind of scary. And I thought, you know, in fact, I told him, I said, you know, Dad, that, that, that doesn't sound right to me. That doesn't, there are no chapters in the book of Acts like that. And the demon told Peter to, you know, whatever, go home. And he said, okay, just don't beat me up, right? So he, he said, Dave, you're being too hard on yourself. You're being too idealistic. But me, I just thought, I, I, I don't, I know that God is real. I, I know that. I've experienced the love of God. I'm not going to give up on that ever for any reason. But I do not have to be a spiritual leader and be in this situation where what I believe is way over here and what I experience is way over here. I said, I don't have to do that. I, I don't have to be the scuba instructor that has never been out of the four-foot level of the pool. Right? I don't have to do that. 
And so I told Cheryl, I said, you know what, I'm not going to do this my whole life. I said, I got, I got no problem with God, the Bible, Jesus Christ, but, but this whole religious system where, where we're always talking about things that we never experience, I do not want to be the guy on stage with that going on. I never again want somebody in the back of the room to say, excuse me, have you ever done that? I, I don't want that to happen. So, I decided to move to Australia because there are lots of horses and nobody knew me down there. So, I resigned from the Bible college and, and I was administrating a, a Christian school and I was part of an apostol international apostolic coalition and I thought that was humorous too. I just thought, how can I be an apostle? I'm 28 years old and can't find my butt with both hands on, on, on anything that's truly supernatural. And I'm in Pete Wagner's International Coalition of Apostles. That just seems a little weird to me. So I resigned from all that stuff and got a job and a truck and um, a house all lined up in Melbourne, Australia. And we had uh, uh, resigned from everything and leased our house and we were on our way. And I got a call from another apostolic network that I'd been a part of called Ministers Fellowship International. And the head apostle said, Dave, uh, I heard you're moving to Australia. Yep. Uh, he said, well, I, I want you to just go on, on one more uh, church assignment, an apostolic assignment, to go to a church and to troubleshoot it and try to figure out what was wrong and what needed changed. And I said, no, not, not interested. He said, oh, please. I said, not interested. He said, one more time. And I said, I quit already. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm done. And he begged me. And um, so anyway, he was sort of like a spiritual father. Uh, in some ways, he'd been the president of the Bible college I graduated from. And so I, I said, Dick, uh, I will do this one last time. If you promise me. I want you to verbally promise me you will never, ever ask me again in my entire life, ever. He said, oh, man, you know, don't do that. I said, no, that's the deal. He said, oh, come on, please, David, don't do that. I said, no, that's the deal. I'm either not going to go at all or you promise me you'll never ask me again, ever. So he said, okay, I promise. So I said, okay, what's the assignment? He said... Uh, the, go to this place called Yuba City. There's a church that's struggling there. It keeps writing letters that they're struggling. And I want you to spend three days and talk to everybody that wants to talk and then fly back to Portland and give me an assessment and then you can go to Australia. I said, okay, three days. That's the deal. So I flew to Yuba City. And they gave me an office and everybody in this church that was a very troubled church and everybody was mad at everybody and it's just you know the last thing I wanted to do is is hear all this stuff right and I didn't really have grace for it and I uh, no one who's 28 years old should be an apostle uh, and they sure shouldn't have to just you know uh, go through all the the funky stuff of dysfunctional churches and I had been doing that for way too long. So anyway, I'm sitting there uh, saying, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, trying to be sweet to these people as they were coming in and unloading, you know, I hate so-and-so, it's so-and-so's fault, you know, blah, 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 the color of the carpet's wrong, they never should have remodeled. Uh, just like, okay, okay, next. Okay, okay, thank you very much. God bless you, next. And... And uh, 
there's all kinds of in insignificant stuff that is the result of extreme immature believers that aren't getting along because they lack uh, any significant quantity of grace. So anyway, I was just jotting that all down. And the, the only thing that kept coming up over and over is I would say any, anything positive? Can you think of anything positive to say about the church? And uh, a number of people said, well, it was a lot better when Lou Benninger was here. I wrote his name down. Next person in, well, uh, you know, I really like Lou Benninger. Circled his name, underlined his name, put a star by his name. Just like, eh, I think we got a theme here. So the last day, the last guy I interviewed was uh, an elder at the church, and he was also an attorney. And so he told me, you know, uh, all the things that he thought was wrong and, and you know, just more boring stuff. And, and so when he was done, I said, okay, you're the, you're the last guy I'm talking to, and I'm all done here. I'll go give my report to Dick Iverson, and he'll contact you. But I said, I've got a question for you. I said, who's Lou Benninger? He said, oh, Lou Benninger? He's like really the, the father of this church. I said, he is? He said, oh, yeah. He was uh, a real radical guy. And uh, he used to be a cocaine dealer that ran a nudist colony up in the foothills. I said, a cocaine dealer that ran a nudist colony? He said, yeah, and then he got saved, and he's a, re he's a really unique guy. I said, sounds unique. I said, what happened to him? He said, well, he, he got tired with what he calls humbug. Still, Lou still calls it humbug. Yeah, it's humbug. Anyway, he said he got tired of what he called the humbug, and he just left. And he took $3 million with him. And I said, What? He said he left. I said, yeah, I, I got that. Did, did you say he took $3 million? He said, oh, yeah, he took $3 million with him. I said, from the church? He said, yeah. I said, no, well, okay, let me get this straight. A guy stole $3 million from the church. He said, well, you know, he doesn't think he stole it. And I said, okay, don't mess with me, dude. You're an attorney. Was it given to him, or was it not given to him? He said, oh, it was, wasn't given to him. I said, so, okay, so help me here. He took $3 million from the church that was not offered to him. I said, yeah. I said, that's commonly called stealing. He said, well, you know, uh, that's not his perspective. I said, you're an attorney, dude. What's your perspective? And he said, well, you know, he probably shouldn't have done it. And I said, you know what? I didn't think anything down here would puzzle me. But, but I cannot figure out what you're trying to say here. I said, is he in jail? He said, oh, no, nobody wants to see Lou go to jail. I said, uh, uh, okay, already. Do you have his phone number? He gave me his phone number. He said, why do you want his phone number? He said, because I want to talk to him. He said, oh, he won't talk to you. I said, you bet your red rosy he'll talk to me. And he said, I don't think he will, but I had a plan, right? So I went to a local restaurant, and I called him up. I said, Lou Benninger, my name's Dave Bryant. He said, yeah, I heard you're a new kid in town uh, trying to sort out that church. And uh, he said, good luck with that, by the way. And I said, okay, I, I don't want to talk about the church, but I want to talk to you. I want you to come down and meet me. He said, not going to do it. I said, okay, let me explain you something. I said, your choices tonight are to talk to me or to talk to the sheriff. Those are your two choices. He was quiet for a minute. He said, ah, somebody told you about the money. I said, yeah, somebody told me about the money. And he said, you know, you don't even know me. And, and you want me to go to jail over something that you don't know anything about? And I said, no, that's not it. The point is, if you had come talk to me, I would know more about it. I said, I'm, I'm just asking to talk to you. 
and, uh, and, and it's important to me. So come down here and talk to me, or I'm just going to call the sheriff department because I got their number right here. He said, oh, brother. He said, I'll, I'll give you a half hour. So he came down. I said, why would you steal the money? He said, I didn't steal the money. They didn't tell you. I'm the one that put it in the bank. And I said, so you think it's your money? He said, yeah, I put it in the bank. And I said, did you give it to the church? He said, well, I thought they were going to use it for missions. And when I found out that they were just wasting it on stupid stuff, I figured out a way to get it out. And I said, you know you can go to prison for that. He said, yeah, there's some things worth going to prison for. And I thought, I like this guy. <laughs> so I said, well, um, you're the only person that time after time people said the church was going better when Lou was here. And I want to ask you to come back to the church. And he said, that ain't going to happen ever. I said, why not? He said, because I would rather go back to smoking dope and running naked in the foothills than go back to that church. And I thought, I like this guy. <laughs> He's radical. And something happened to me that is, hasn't happened since. I've only heard of it happening one other time. But anyway, I heard myself saying things and I was just sitting there listening to myself, thinking, oh my God, am I saying this out loud? But I said, why don't you come back to the church, and I'll come pastor, and we'll read the Bible, and try to do what Jesus did. And if that doesn't work, I'll go smoke dope with you. <laughs> I'm a cowboy from Idaho. I've never smoked dope. Never been interested in it. And he, he has these little wire rim glasses, and he pulled them down. He said, uh, have you ever smoked dope? I said, no. He said, well, you need to know I have smoked everything possible to smoke. He said, there is no dope of any kind that I have not um, experimented with. And I said, all right. He said, well, I want you to know that I'm going to hold you accountable to that. And I said, well, if we read the Bible and try to do what Jesus did and it doesn't work, I'll hold myself accountable. Put his glasses back up and he took a drink of coffee and stared at me. We'd only known each other about 20 minutes. And suddenly he just stuck his hand out, said, deal. And I shook his hand. I thought, my God, what have I done? <laughs> and so he said, so what do we do now? And I was, I was thinking, I have no idea what we do now. So I said, well, First off, no one has invited me to pastor the church. He said, so how are you going to come down and be the pastor? I said, that's my point. Probably won't happen. He said, well, what, what was the deal that we just made? I said, well, if it's God's will, then they will have to ask me to come pastor, which they haven't done. And then I just threw this in there because I thought, oh, my God, I can't, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I just blurted this out without thinking about it. And I've got a job and a house and a truck in Australia. So I said, and, and furthermore, there would have to be a 100% unanimous vote for the whole church to have me come. And he said, oh, brother. He said, that church has never been unanimous about anything, including the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, well, those are the deals. 
He said, all right, let me know. So I went back to Portland. By the time I got to Portland with my report, the apostle said, hey, uh, they called and asked if you'd come pastor the church. I said, they did? He said, yeah. I said, you sure? He said, of course I'm sure. I took the call. I said, huh, how odd. I called my wife. She said, how'd the trip to Yuba City go? I said, oh. <laughs> okay. And she knew I didn't want to go in the first place. She said, okay. I said, yeah, how'd the trip to Phoenix go? She said, oh, fine. I told my folks we were moving to Melbourne and they said, we'll come over and visit you uh, once a year. And, and uh, she said, but, but tell me about Yuba City. I said, oh, met a very interesting guy. She said, that does not sound like you. Said, well, he's a really interesting guy. She said, and? I said, and? And I, I told him that if he came back to the church, I'd come pastor it and we'd read the Bible and try to do what Jesus did. And if it didn't work, I'd go smoke dope with him. <laughs> she was just dead quiet. She said, you would go smoke dope with him. I said, only if it doesn't work. She said, David, you are not going to smoke dope with anybody. And I said, well, then we need to pray that it works. She was just quiet for a minute. She said, okay then, Yuba City instead of Melbourne. And so we went down there. We, we held a meeting. I'd, I'd never pastored before. And uh, they voted. There were 70 people there. 70 people voted for me to come be the pastor. Now that was totally supernatural. You know that, right? Because they didn't know me and... And I was kind of on a wild one the whole weekend, you know, like next, you know. So it was a sovereign deal. So Lou came back, and we got two other guys. We went up to uh, Lake Tahoe, a beautiful place. And I was desperate because I did not want to run naked in the woods and smoke dope, not ever, right? I was a desperate guy. So I said, listen... I've had it up to here with, with religious bureaucracy. I never want to be around it again. So I'm going to fire everybody that's associated with the church. Everybody. Secretaries. All the elders step down. All the deacons step down. We're going to forget about the great American religious enterprise that we've been part of for decades. And we're going to read the Bible... And we're going to try to do what Jesus did. And I said, Lou, Lou and I made an agreement here. And you, you need to know that it's high stakes and I'm a desperate man. So we have got to make this work. And so I said, let's pray tonight and ask God to speak to one of us. And that night, I woke up with Acts 10.38 on my mind. And... I mean, on my mind. I knew, I didn't even know what it said. I just knew this is God's answer. So I looked it up. And it said, Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And so I told him, I said, we prayed last night. I woke up with this verse. This is our answer. We're going to do what Jesus did. And this is what Jesus did. And so one of them said, What's it mean to heal all who are oppressed of the devil? I said, I don't know. I, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to do it. So let's start with the first part, because I can pull that off. He went about doing good. I can do that. And the Bible says, if you do natural things, God will give you spiritual treasures. And if you do little things, God will give you bigger things to do. So let's get an A-plus on doing good. And if God wants to teach us to heal those who oppress the devil, he'll have to teach us because none of us know what that means or how to do it. 
So we all said, yeah, yeah knuckles, you know, it sounds like a good plan. So we prayed a little while and talked, and we came out with the ministry motto, find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. And we came back and we painted it on the wall. We said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And uh, I became the fire department chaplain, and Lou became the sheriff department chaplain. And we wrote a letter to the, uh, the uh, director of, of uh, human services for the two counties that we're associated with. And we didn't even quote the last part of the verse because we didn't know how to do it, right? We said, Jesus went about doing good. We're followers of Jesus. And if there's anything good that we can do in these counties that you know of, let us know. And if we can do it, we will do it. And so that started us down a road that we're still on 33 and a half years later. And we started all kinds of ministries. We started the trauma intervention program. We started Babies Out of Bondage. We started Teen Runaway Hotline. We started a thing for single moms called Pretty on a Shoestring. And we just had ladies that would come alongside a single mom and say, hey, you know, if you know where to shop, you can get really good clothes, consignment clothes for next to nothing. And they would become surrogate moms for them and help them get their clothes. We started a program called Auto Docs. And, and, and uh, Edmund Smith, the director of human services, he, he started feeding us names. Like this is a single mom. She is desperate and her car broke down. All right, we got mechanics. We'll fix it for free. And the church started growing. And they went from 70 to you know, uh, 250 to 500 to 750 to 1,000 to 1,250 to over 1,500 people. And we were just meeting urgent needs. The Bible says in uh, Titus 2.14, teach the people to meet urgent needs and they will never be unfruitful. Pretty easy, really. And, and our church was filled with, with people that we had reached out to. And, um, and it was a beautiful thing. And right when it was, you know, we were just riding the wave to the beach. And uh, God kicked in the clutch and shifted gears. Said, yeah, you remember the part about healing those who are oppressed of the devil? It's time to do that. And uh, I was so happy with the first part of the verse. I was just like, yeah, let's just keep doing what we're doing. It's working great. But anyway, um, God has his way of grabbing you by the short hairs, like Grandma used to say. And, and he said, no, we made a deal, and I want you to heal those who are oppressed of the devil. And so uh, that's another exciting story that I will tell you about tomorrow morning. But anyway, uh, that's a little bit about how we got started. Uh, now, listen, uh, right now, what God is doing in the church... Uh, from coast to coast and throughout the different nations is, is he's sorting out the wheat from the chaff. And God is not impressed with the great American religious enterprise. Neither is God impressed with any denomination of any kind. If denominations were a good idea, Jesus Christ would have started one. It's that, it's that simple. Either he, he's in heaven saying, gee, I wish I'd have thought of that. Or else he's in heaven saying, why don't you just do things the way I, I modeled? So I'm just putting that out there, okay? Uh, there's a lot of things that happen in the name of Christ that Christ is not impressed with. And so remember the parable of uh, the, the, the great harvest? Uh, there was a great field, and the servants of God sowed it with, with good seed. And then they saw there was all kinds of mixture in it. And they said to the master, we sowed good seed. Where did all this mixture come from? You remember what he said? He said, while you were sleeping, the enemy sowed this. They said, well, what do we do now? And he said, now you're going to need supernatural help to un unravel this. 
That's what he said. Remember, he said, don't, don't try to pull it up. You'll screw everything up because you can't tell what's wheat and what's tares, right? They look a lot alike right down to the last minute. Who would have known that Judas was one of the tares? Peter didn't know. He never even suspected Judas. He suspected himself. <laughs> he said, hey, John, ask him, am I the bad guy? Because I'm probably the bad guy, <laughs> right? Never even suspected Judas. It's, it's hard to tell the wheat from the tares. You cannot tell them by their church attendance or many, many other things. But God sovereignly, he's sorting out the wheat from the chaff. And it's happening in every church, in every denomination, from coast to coast in America and throughout the world. Uh, th this is the season of the great harvest, and God is sorting things out. And it's a beautiful thing. The wheat is being bound together. It happens supernaturally. I, I didn't know Kevin and Kimmy, right? It was just like, huh, we, somehow we met. That's, that's happening over and over and over again. These days, it, it happens for sure every week, but almost every day these days. It's supernatural, sovereign connections. God is binding the wheat together. And, and they're coming out of all kind of different backgrounds. That, that, that's not what matters. What, what matters is, is the, the wheat are the children of the kingdom who understand the kingdom and aren't sidetracked by the great American religious enterprise or, or, or any other funky stuff that gets in the way. And God's also... The, remember, the angels come. It's, it's supernatural intervention that sorts out the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the tares. Uh, and, and Jesus says that in the parable. He says the angels will gather in the harvest and, and sort things out. And so also, you're seeing these sortings that are sometimes surprising. Like, oh, wow. Who would ever imagine and you can, you can put a lot of names in there. I'll, I'll let you sort that out on your own. But I got a list of names. Who would ever imagine that that guy, that woman, would, would be like that? Long list of situations. But, but God's exposing things. And God's separating the wheat from the chaff. And, and we should be excited about it. Because it is called the great harvest and God is involved. And I think that's awesome. It's a wonderful thing. So, uh, so that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I would encourage you, wherever you are in your faith, you need to reach down and crank it up a notch. You need to get serious about the kingdom of God. I'm thankful that the entire world system is shaking right now. I'm thankful because I'm tired of people that have part of their faith in the American dollar and part of their faith in this and part of their faith. Forget all that stuff. God has an eternal kingdom that will never pass away. It will fill the earth. It will grind every other kingdom to powder and it will be blown away by a great wind. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that few people sneak out to heaven and the devil will take over the earth. Does that sound like an almighty, eternal, wise God? That is not going to happen. God's going to win. He's going to win big. And he's raising up sons and daughters of the kingdom that will be a part of that great last day harvest. So don't miss out on it. So, Jesus, help us. We need your help. We need your grace. So, I, I believe that, that no one here wants to be hypocritical and stuck in a religious system and just well, singing kumbaya behind stained glass and wasting time. I, I don't believe that. I believe these are hungry people that want to be true sons and daughters of the kingdom. Lord, I, I pray for grace to be poured out from heaven. I pray that this church will have a significant part in what you're doing in the world today. Right here in Hilo, Lord, I pray for the anointing of God to come on this church, 
pray for them to be uh, uh, the salt of the earth and the light of the world at a level that they've never even dreamed of before. That they will carry the glory and the authority of the eternal kingdom. Lord Jesus, help none of them to sleep through the harvest. Wake them up. Pour out your spirit on them. Cause them to, to be hungry and to stay hungry. And Lord, uh, cause them to, uh, to stretch toward the fullness of your great and precious promises. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.